You fool! Warren is dead. Welcome to Horror Babble. Today we're pleased to present the sixth and final story in the series John Silence Physician Extraordinary by British author Algernon Blackwood. Dr. John Silence is a psychic doctor, in which he employs his special powers to assist those suffering from psychical afflictions. In this final offering, the good doctor assists a man whose interest in higher dimensions has landed him in a spot of bother. This recording is dedicated to our Cthulhu and Yellow Level Horror Babblers on Patreon, each of whom are named in the video description below. Thanks as always for your support, folks. And without further ado, this is a victim of higher space. We hope you enjoy it. John Silence, Physician Extraordinary, Case 6, A Victim of Higher Space, by Algernon Blackwood. There's a extraordinary gentleman to see you, sir, said the new man. Why extraordinary? asked Dr. Silence, drawing the tips of his thin fingers through his brown beard. His eyes twinkled pleasantly. Why extraordinary, Barker? he repeated encouragingly, noticing the perplexed expression in the man's eyes. "'He's so—so so thin, sir. I could hardly see him at all, at first. He was inside the house before I could ask the name,' he added, remembering strict orders. "'And who brought him here? He come alone, sir, in a closed cab. He pushed by me before I could say a word, making no noise not what I could hear. He seemed to move so soft—' Like— The man stopped short with obvious embarrassment, as though he had already said enough to jeopardize his new situation, but trying hard to show that he remembered the instructions and warnings he had received with regard to the admission of strangers not properly accredited. "'And where is the gentleman now?' asked Dr. Silence, turning away to conceal his amusement. "'I really couldn't exactly say, sir. I left him standing in the hall.' The doctor looked up sharply. "'But why in the hall, Barker? Why not in the waiting-room?" He fixed his piercing, though kindly, eyes on the man's face. "'Did he frighten you?' he asked quickly. "'I think he did, sir, if I may say so. I seem to lose sight of him, as it were,' the man stammered, evidently convinced by now that he had earned his dismissal. "'He come in so funny, just like a cold wind,' he added boldly setting his heels at attention, and looking his master full in the face. The doctor made an internal note of the man's halting description. He was pleased that the slight signs of psychic intuition which had induced him to engage Barker had not entirely failed at the first trial. Dr. Silence sought for this qualification in all his assistants, from secretary to serving man, and if it surrounded him with a somewhat singular crew— the drawbacks were more than compensated for on the whole by their occasional flashes of insight. So the gentleman made you feel queer, did he? That was it, I think, sir, repeated the man stolidly. And he brings no kind of introduction to me, no letter or anything? asked the doctor, with feigned surprise, as though he knew what was coming. The man fumbled, both in mind and pockets, and finally produced an envelope. I beg pardon, sir— he said, greatly flustered. The gentleman handed me this for you. It was a note from a discerning friend, who had never yet sent him a case that was not vitally interesting from one point or another. Please see the bearer of this note, the brief message ran, though I doubt if even you can do much to help him. John Silence paused a moment, so as to gather from the mind of the writer all that lay behind the brief words of the letter. Then he looked up at his servant, with a graver expression than he had yet worn. "'Go back and find this gentleman,' he said, "'and show him into the green study. Do not reply to his question, or speak more than actually necessary. But think kind, helpful, sympathetic thoughts as strongly as you can, Barker. You remember what I told you about the importance of thinking when I engaged you. 
Put curiosity out of your mind, and think gently, sympathetically, affectionately, if you can. He smiled, and Barker, who had recovered his composure in the doctor's presence, bowed silently and went out. There were two different reception rooms in Dr. Silence's house. One, intended for persons who imagined they needed spiritual assistance when really they were only candidates for the asylum, had padded walls, and was well supplied with various concealed contrivances by means of which sudden violence could be instantly met and overcome. It was, however, rarely used. The other, intended for the reception of genuine cases of spiritual distress and out-of-the-way afflictions of a psychic nature, was entirely draped and furnished in a soothing deep green, calculated to induce calmness and repose of mind. And this room was the one in which Dr. Silence interviewed the majority of his queer cases, and the one into which he had directed Barker to show his present caller. To begin with, the armchair in which the patient was always directed to sit was nailed to the floor, since its immovability tended to impart this same excellent characteristic to the occupant. Patients invariably grew excited when talking about themselves, and their excitement tended to confuse their thoughts and to exaggerate their language. The inflexibility of the chair helped to counteract this. After repeated endeavours to drag it forward or push it back, they ended by resigning themselves to sitting quietly, and with the futility of fidgeting, there followed a calmer state of mind. Upon the floor, and at intervals in the wall immediately behind, were certain tiny green buttons, practically unnoticeable, which, on being pressed, permitted a soothing and persuasive narcotic to rise invisibly about the occupant of the chair. The effect upon the excitable patient was rapid, admirable, and harmless. The green study was further provided with a secret spy-hole, for John Silence liked, when possible, to observe his patient's face before it had assumed that mask the features of the human countenance invariably wear in the presence of another person. A man sitting alone wears a psychic expression, and this expression is the man himself. It disappears the moment another person joins him, and Dr. Silence often learned more from a few moments' secret observation of a face than from hours of conversation with its owner afterwards. A very light, almost a dancing step, followed Barker's heavy tread towards the green room, and a moment afterwards the man came in and announced that the gentleman was waiting. He was still pale, and his manner nervous. "'Never mind, Barker,' the doctor said kindly. "'If you were not psychic, the man would have had no effect upon you at all. You only need training and development, and when you have learned to interpret these feelings and sensations better, you will feel no fear, but only a great sympathy. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. And Barker bowed and made his escape, while Dr. Silence, an amused smile lurking about the corners of his mouth, made his way noiselessly down the passage, and put his eye to the spy-hole in the door of the green study. This spy-hole was so placed that it commanded a view of almost the entire room, and, looking through it, the doctor saw a hat gloves and umbrella lying on a chair by the table, but searched at first in vain for their owner. The windows were both closed, and a brisk fire burned in the grate. There were various signs, signs intelligible at least to a keenly intuitive soul, that the room was occupied. Yet so far as human beings were concerned, it was empty, utterly empty. No one sat in the chairs, no one stood on the mat before the fire— There was no sign even that a patient was anywhere close against the wall, examining the buckling reproductions, as patients so often did when they thought they were alone, and therefore rather difficult to see from the spy-hole. Ordinarily speaking, there was no one in the room. It was undeniable. Yet Dr. Silence was quite well aware that a human being was in the room. His psychic apparatus never failed in letting him know the proximity— of an incarnate or discarnate being. Even in the dark he could tell that. And he now knew positively that his patient, the patient who had alarmed Barker, and had then tripped down the corridor with that dancing footstep, was somewhere concealed within the four walls commanded by his spy-hole. 
He also realized, and this was most unusual, that this individual whom he desired to watch knew that he was being watched, and, further, that the stranger himself was also watching. In fact, that it was he, the doctor, who was being observed, and by an observer as keen and trained as himself. An inkling of the true state of the case began to dawn upon him, and he was on the verge of entering. Indeed, his hand already touched the doorknob, when his eye, still glued to the spy-hole, detected a slight movement. Directly opposite, between him and the fireplace, something stirred. He watched very attentively, and made certain that he was not mistaken. An object on the mantelpiece, it was a blue vase, disappeared from view. It passed out of sight together with the portion of the marble mantelpiece on which it rested. Next, that part of the fire and grate and brass fender immediately below it vanished entirely, as though a slice had been taken clean out of them. Dr. Silence then understood that something between him and these objects was slowly coming into being, something that concealed them and obstructed his vision by inserting itself in the line of sight between them and himself. He quietly awaited further results before going in. First he saw a thin perpendicular line, tracing itself from just above the height of the clock, and continuing downwards till it reached the woolly fire-mat. This line grew wider, broadened, grew solid. It was no shadow. It was something substantial. It defined itself more and more. Then suddenly, at the top of the line, and about on a level with the face of the clock, he saw a round luminous disk gazing steadily at him. It was a human eye, looking straight into his own, pressed there against the spy-hole, and it was bright with intelligence. Dr. Silence held his breath for a moment, and stared back at it. Then, like someone moving out of deep shadow into light, he saw the figure of a man come sliding sideways into view, a whitish face following the eye, and the perpendicular line he had first observed broadening out and developing into the complete figure of a human being. It was the patient. He had apparently been standing there in front of the fire all the time. A second eye had followed the first, and both of them stared steadily at the spy-hole, sharply concentrated, yet with a sly twinkle of humour and amusement that made it impossible for the doctor to maintain his position any longer. He opened the door and went in quickly. As he did so, he noticed for the first time the sound of a German band coming in gaily through the open ventilators. In some intuitive, unaccountable fashion, the music connected itself with the patient he was about to interview. This sort of provision was not unfamiliar to him. It always explained itself later. The man, he saw, was of middle age and of very ordinary appearance so ordinary, in fact, that he was difficult to describe, his only peculiarity being his extreme thinness. Pleasant, that is, good, vibrations issued from his atmosphere, and met Dr. Silence as he advanced to greet him, yet vibrations alive with currents and discharges betraying the perturbed and disordered condition of his mind and brain. There was evidently something wholly out of the usual in the state of his thoughts— Yet, though strange, it was not altogether distressing. It was not the impression that the broken and violent atmosphere of the insane produces upon the mind. Dr. Silence realized in a flash that here was a case of absorbing interest that might require all his powers to handle properly. "'I was watching you through my little peephole, as you saw,' he began, with a pleasant smile, advancing to shake hands. I find it of the greatest assistance sometimes. But the patient interrupted him at once. His voice was hurried, and had odd, shrill changes in it, breaking from high to low in unexpected fashion. One moment it thundered, the next it almost squeaked. I, I understand without explanation, he broke in rapidly. You get the true note of a man in this way, when he thinks himself unobserved. I quite agree. But only in my case, I fear, you saw very little. My case, as you of course grasp, Dr. Silence, is extremely peculiar, uncomfortably peculiar. Indeed, unless Sir William had positively assured me. My friend has sent you to me. 
the doctor interrupted gravely, with a gentle note of authority. And that is quite sufficient. Pray be seated, Mr. Mudge, Racine Mudge, returned the other. Take this comfortable one, Mr. Mudge, leading him to the fixed chair, and tell me your condition in your own way, and at your own pace. My whole day is at your service, if you require it. Mr. Mudge moved towards the chair in question, and then hesitated. "'You will promise me not to use the narcotic buttons,' he said, before sitting down. "'I do not need them. Also, I ought to mention that anything you think of vividly will reach my mind. That is apparently part of my peculiar case.' He sat down with a sigh, and arranged his thin legs and body into a position of comfort. Evidently he was very sensitive to the thoughts of others, for the picture of the green buttons had only entered the doctor's mind for a second, yet the other had instantly snapped it up. Dr. Silence noticed, too, that Mr. Mudge held on tightly with both hands to the arms of the chair. "'I'm rather glad the chair is nailed to the floor,' he remarked, as he settled himself more comfortably. "'It suits me admirably. The fact is, and this is my case in a nutshell, which is all that a doctor of your marvellous development requires. The fact is, Dr. Silence, I am a victim of higher space. That's what's the matter with me. Higher space!" The two looked at each other for a space in silence, the little patient holding tightly to the arms of the chair which suited him admirably, and looking up with staring eyes, his atmosphere positively trembling with the waves of some unknown activity while the doctor smiled kindly and sympathetically, and put his whole person as far as possible into the mental condition of the other. "'Higher space!' repeated Mr. Mudge. "'That's what it is. Now, do you think you can help me with that?' There was a pause, during which the men's eyes steadily searched down below the surface of their respective personalities. Then Dr. Silence spoke. "'I am quite sure I can help,' he answered quietly. "'Sympathy must always help, and suffering always owns my sympathy. I see you have suffered cruelly. You must tell me all about your case, and when I hear the gradual steps by which you reached this strange condition, I have no doubt I can be of assistance to you.' He drew a chair up beside his interlocutor, and laid a hand on his shoulder for a moment. His whole being radiated kindness, intelligence, desire to help. For instance, he went on, I feel sure it was the result of no mere chance that you became familiar with the terrors of what you term higher space. For higher space is no mere external measurement. It is, of course, a spiritual state, a spiritual condition, an inner development, and one that we must recognize as abnormal since it is beyond the reach of the world at the present stage of evolution. Higher space is a mythical state." "'Ah!' Oh, cried the other, rubbing his bird-like hands with pleasure. "'The relief it is to be able to talk to someone who can understand! Of course what you say is the utter truth, and you are right that no mere chance led me to my present condition, but, on the other hand, prolonged and deliberate study. Yet, Chance, in a sense, now governs it. I mean, by entering the condition of higher space seems to depend upon the chance of this and that circumstance. For instance, the mere sound of that German band sent me off. Not that all music will do so, but certain sounds, certain vibrations, at once key me up to the requisite pitch, and off I go. Wagner's music always does it, and that band must have been playing a stray bit of Wagner. But I'll come to all that later. Only first, I must ask you to send away your man from the spy-hole." John Silence looked up with a start, for Mr. Mudge's back was to the door, and there was no mirror. He saw the brown eye of Barker glued to the little circle of glass, and he crossed the room without a word, and snapped down the black shutter provided for the purpose, and then heard Barker snuffle away along the passage. Now continued the little man in the chair. I can begin. You have managed to put me completely at my ease, and I feel I may tell you my whole case without shame or reserve. You will understand. 
but you must be patient with me if I go into details that are already familiar to you. Details of higher space, I mean. And if I seem stupid when I have to describe things that transcend the power of language and are really, therefore, indescribable. My dear friend, put in the other calmly, that goes without saying. To know higher space is an experience that defies description, and one is obliged to make use of more or less intelligible symbols, but pray proceed. Your vivid thoughts will tell me more than your halting words. An immense sigh of relief proceeded from the little figure, half lost in the depths of the chair. Such intelligent sympathy meeting him halfway was a new experience to him, and it touched his heart at once. He leaned back, relaxing his tight hold of the arms, and began in his thin, scale-like voice. "'My mother was a Frenchwoman, and my father an Essex bargeman,' he said abruptly. "'Hence my name, Racine and Mudge. My father died before I ever saw him. My mother inherited money from her Bordeaux relations, and when she died soon after I was left alone with wealth and a strange freedom.' I had no guardian, trustees, sisters, brothers, or any connection in the world to look after me. I grew up, therefore, utterly without education. This much was to my advantage. I learned none of that deceitful rubbish taught in schools, and so had nothing to unlearn when I awakened to my true love. <laughs> mathematics, higher mathematics, and higher geometry. These, however, I seemed to know instinctively. It was like the memory of what I had deeply studied before. The principles were in my blood, and I simply raced through the ordinary stages and beyond, and then did the same with geometry. Afterwards, when I read the books on these subjects, I understood how swift and undeviating the knowledge had come back to me. <laughs> it was simple memory. It was simply recollecting the memories of what I had known before in a previous existence, and required no books to teach me. In his growing excitement, Mr. Mudge attempted to drag the chair forward a little nearer to his listener, and then smiled faintly as he resigned himself instantly again to its immovability, and plunged anew into the recital of his singular disease. The audacious speculations of Boyle, the amazing theories of Gauss, that through a point more than one line could be drawn parallel to a given line, the possibility that the angles of a triangle are together greater than two right angles, if drawn upon immense curvatures, the breathless intuitions of Beltrami and Lobachevsky, all these I hurried through, and emerged, panting but unsatisfied, upon the verge of my, my new world, my higher space possibilities, in a word, my disease. How I got there— he resumed after a brief pause, during which he appeared to be listening intently for an approaching sound, is more than I can put intelligibly into words. I can only hope to leave your mind with an intuitive comprehension of the possibility of what I say. Here, however, came a change. At this point I was no longer absorbing the fruits of studies I had made before— it was the beginning of new efforts to learn for the first time, and I had to go slowly and laboriously through terrible work. Here I sought for the theories and speculations of others, but books were few and far between, and with the exception of one man, a dreamer, the world called him, whose audacity and piercing intuition amazed and delighted me beyond description, I found no one to guide or help. You, of course, Dr. Silence, understand something of what I am driving at with these stammering words, though you cannot perhaps yet guess what depths of pain my new knowledge brought me to, nor why an acquaintance with a new development of space should prove a source of misery and terror. Mr. Racine Mudge, remembering that the chair would not move, did the next best thing he could in his desire to draw nearer to the attentive man facing him and sat forward upon the very edge of the cushions, crossing his legs and gesticulating with both hands as though he saw into this region of new space he was attempting to describe, and might any moment tumble into it bodily from the edge of the chair and disappear from view. 
John Silence, separated from him by three paces, sat with his eyes fixed upon the thin, white face opposite, noting every word and every gesture with deep attention. This room we now sit in, Dr. Silence, has one side open to space, to higher space. A closed box only seems closed. There is a way in and out of a soap bubble without breaking the skin. You tell me no new thing, the doctor interposed gently. Hence, if higher space exists, and our world borders upon it, and lies partially in it, it follows necessarily that we see only portions of all objects. We never see their true and complete shape. We see their three measurements, but not their fourth. The new direction is concealed from us, and when I hold this book and move my hand all round it, I have not really made a complete circuit. We only perceive those portions of any object which exist in our three dimensions. The rest escapes us. But once we learn to see in higher space, objects will appear as they actually are. Only they will thus be hardly recognizable. Now you may begin to grasp something of what I am coming to. I am beginning to understand something of what you must have suffered, observed the doctor soothingly, for I have made similar experiments myself, and only stopped just in time. You are the one man in all the world who can hear and understand and sympathize, exclaimed Mr. Mudge, grasping his hand and holding it tightly while he spoke. The nailed chair prevented further excitability. Well, he resumed, after a moment's pause. I procured the implements and the coloured blocks for practical experiment, and I followed the instructions carefully, till I had arrived at a working conception of four-dimensional space. The tesseract, the figure whose boundaries are cubes, I knew by heart. That is to say, I knew it and saw it mentally, for my eye, of course, could never take in a new measurement, or my hands and feet handle it. So, at least, I thought, he added, making a wry face. I had reached the stage, you see, when I could imagine in a new dimension. I was able to conceive the shape of that new figure which is intrinsically different to all we know, the shape of the tesseract. I could perceive it in four dimensions. When, therefore, I looked at a cube, I could see all its sides at once. Its top was not foreshortened nor its farther side and base invisible. I saw the whole thing out flat, so to speak, and this tesseract was bounded by cubes. Moreover, I also saw its content, its insides. You were not yourself able to enter this new world, interrupted Dr. Silence. Not then. I was only able to conceive intuitively what it was like, and how exactly it must look. Later, when I slipped in there, and saw objects in their entirety, unlimited by the paucity of our poor three measurements, I very nearly lost my life. For, you see, space does not stop at a single new dimension, a fourth. It extends in all possible new ones, and we must conceive it as containing any number of new dimensions. In other words, there is no space at all, but only a spiritual condition— but, meanwhile, uh, I had come to grasp the strange fact that the objects in our normal world appear to us only partially. Mr. Mudge moved farther forward, till he was balanced dangerously on the very edge of the chair. From this starting point, he resumed, I began my studies and experiments, and continued them for years. I had money, and I was without friends. I lived in solitude, and experimented. My intellect, of course, had little part in the work, for intellectually it was all unthinkable. Never was the limitation of mere reason more plainly demonstrated. It was mystically, intuitively, spiritually, that I began to advance, and what I learnt, and knew, and did, is all impossible to put into language, since it all describes experiences transcending the experiences of men. It is only some of the results, what you would call the symptoms of my disease, that I can give you, and even these must often appear absurd contradictions and impossible paradoxes. 
"'I can only tell you, Dr. Silence,' his manner became exceedingly impressive, "'that I reached sometimes a point of view whence all the great puzzle of the world became plain to me, and I understood what they call in the yoga books the great heresy of separateness, why all great teachers have urged the necessity of man loving his neighbour as himself, how men are all really one, and why the utter loss of self is necessary to salvation, and the discovery of the true life of the soul. He paused a moment, and drew breath. "'Your speculations have been my own long ago,' the doctor said quietly. "'I fully realise the force of your words. Men are doubtless not separate at all, in the senses they imagine. All this about the very much higher space I only dimly, very dimly conceived, of course,' the other went on, raising his voice again by jerks. But what did happen to me was the humbler accident of the simpler disaster. Oh, dear, how shall I put it? He stammered, and showed visible signs of distress. It was simply this, he resumed with a sudden rush of words, that, accidentally, as the result of my years of experiment, I one day slipped bodily into the next world, the world of four dimensions, yet without knowing precisely how I got there, or how I could get back again. I discovered, that is, that my ordinary three-dimensional body was but an expression, a projection of my higher four-dimensional body. Now you understand what I meant much earlier in our talk when I spoke of chance. I cannot control my entrance or exit. Certain people, certain human atmospheres, certain wandering forces, thoughts— desires even, the radiations of certain combinations of colour, and above all the vibrations of certain kinds of music, will suddenly throw me into a state of what I can only describe as an intense, terrific inner vibration, and <laughs> behold I am off, off in the direction at right angles to all our known directions, off in the direction the cube takes when it begins to trace the outlines of the new figure— off into my breathless and semi-divine higher space, off inside myself, into the world of four dimensions. He gasped and dropped back into the depths of the immovable chair. And there, he whispered, his voice issuing from among the cushions, there I have to stay, until these vibrations subside, or until they do something which I cannot find words to describe properly or intelligibly to you. And then, behold, I am back again. First, that is, I disappear, then I reappear. Just so, exclaimed Dr. Silence. And that is why a few— Why, a few moments ago, interrupted Mr. Mudge, taking the words out of his mouth, you found me gone, and then saw me return— the music of that wretched German band sent me off. Your intense thinking about me brought me back, when the band had stopped its Wagner. I saw you approach the peephole, and I saw Barker's intention of doing so later. For me, no interiors are hidden. I see inside, when in that state the content of your mind, as of your body, is open to me as the day. <laughs> oh dear, oh dear, oh dear! Mr. Mudge stopped and again mopped his brow. A light trembling ran over the surface of his small body like a wind over grass. He still held tightly to the arms of the chair. At first, he presently resumed, my new experiences were so vividly interesting that I felt no alarm. There was no room for it. <laughs> the alarm came a little later. Then you actually penetrated far enough into that state to experience yourself as a normal portion of it? asked the doctor, leaning forward, deeply interested. Mr. Mudge nodded a perspiring face in reply. I did, he whispered. Undoubtedly I did. I am coming to all that. It began first at night, when I realized that sleep brought no loss of consciousness. The spirit, of course, can never sleep. Only the body becomes unconscious, interposed John Silence. Yes, we know that, theoretically. At night, of course, the spirit is active elsewhere, 
and we have no memory of where and how, simply because the brain stays behind and receives no record. But I found that, while remaining conscious, I also retained memory. I had attained to the state of continuous consciousness, for at night I regularly, with the first approaches of drowsiness, entered Nolan's Volans, the four-dimensional world. For a time this happened regularly, and I could not control it, though later I found a way to regulate it better. Apparently sleep is unnecessary in the higher, the four-dimensional body. Yes, perhaps. But I should infinitely have preferred dull sleep to the knowledge, for, unable to control my movements, I wandered to and fro, attracted, owing to my partial development and premature arrival, to parts of this new world that alarmed me more and more. It was the awful waste and drift of a monstrous world, so utterly different to all we know and see, that I cannot even hint at the nature of the sights and objects and beings in it. More than that, I cannot even remember them. I cannot now picture them to myself even, but can recall only the memory of the impression they made upon me, the horror and devastating terror of it all, to be in several places at once, for instance. Perfectly, interrupted John Silence, noticing the increase of the other's excitement. I understand exactly. But now, please, tell me a little more of this alarm you experienced, and how it affected you. It's not the disappearing and reappearing, per se, that I mind, continued Mr. Mudge, so much as certain other things. It's seeing people and objects in their weird entirety, in their true and complete shapes that is so distressing. It introduces me to a world of monsters. Horses, dogs, cats, all of which I loved. People, trees, children— all that I have considered beautiful in life, everything from a human face to a cathedral, appear to me in a different shape and aspect to all I have known before. I cannot perhaps convince you why this should be terrible, but I assure you that it is so. To hear the human voice proceeding from this novel appearance, which I scarcely recognize as a human body, is ghastly, simply ghastly. To see inside everything and everybody is a form of insight peculiarly distressing. To be so confused in geography as to find myself one moment at the North Pole, and the next at Clapham Junction, or possibly at both places simultaneously, is absurdly terrifying. Your imagination will readily furnish other details without my multiplying my experiences now. But you have no idea what it all means, and how I suffer." Mr. Mudge paused in his panting account, and lay back in his chair. He still held tightly to the arms, as though they could keep him in the world of sanity in three measurements, and only now and again released his left hand in order to mop his face. He looked very thin and white and oddly unsubstantial, and he stared about him as though he saw into this other space he had been talking about. John Silence, too, felt warm. He had listened to every word, and had made many notes. The presence of this man had an exhilarating effect upon him. It seemed as if Mr. Racine Mudge still carried about with him something of that breathless higher space condition he had been describing. At any rate, Dr. Silence had himself advanced sufficiently far along the legitimate paths of spiritual and psychic transformations to realize that the visions of this extraordinary little person had a basis of truth for their origin. After a pause that prolonged itself into minutes, he crossed the room and unlocked a drawer in a bookcase, taking out a small book with a red cover. It had a lock to it, and he produced a key out of his pocket and proceeded to open the covers. The bright eyes of Mr. Mudge never left him for a single second. "'It almost seems a pity,' he said at length to cure you, Mr. Mudge. You are on the way to discovery of great things. Though you may lose your life in the process—that is, your life here in the world of three dimensions, you would lose thereby nothing of great value. You will pardon my apparent rudeness, I know. And you might gain what is infinitely greater. Your suffering, of course, lies in the fact that you alternate between the two worlds. 
and are never wholly in one or the other. Also, I rather imagine, though I cannot be certain of this from any personal experiments, that you have here and there penetrated even into space of more than four dimensions, and have hence experienced the terror you speak of. The perspiring son of the Essex bargeman and the woman of Normandy bent his head several times in assent, but uttered no word in reply. Some strange psychic predisposition, dating no doubt from one of your former lives, has favoured the development of your disease, and the fact that you had no normal training at school or college, no leading by the poor intellect into the cul-de-sac falsely called knowledge, has further caused your exceedingly rapid movement along the lines of direct inner experience. None of the knowledge you have foreshadowed has come to you through the senses, of course. Mr. Mudge, sitting in his immovable chair, began to tremble slightly. A wind again seemed to pass over his surface, and again to set it curiously in motion like a field of grass. "'You are merely talking to gain time,' he said hurriedly, in a shaking voice. "'This thinking aloud delays us. I see ahead what you are coming to. Only please be quick, for something is going to happen. A band is again coming down the street, and if it plays—if it plays Wagner, I shall be off in a twinkling. Precisely, I will be quick. I was leading up to the point of how to effect your cure. The way is this. You must simply learn to block the entrances. True, true, utterly true, exclaimed the little man, dodging about nervously in the depths of the chair. But how, in the name of space, is that to be done? By concentration. They are all within you, these entrances, although outer cases such as colour, music, and other things lead you towards them. These external things you cannot hope to destroy, but once the entrances are blocked, they will lead you only to bricked walls and closed channels. You will no longer be able to find the way. Quick! Quick! cried the bobbing figure in the chair. Uh, how is this concentration to be effected? This little book— continued Dr. Silence calmly, will explain to you the way. He tapped the cover. Let me now read out to you certain simple instructions, composed, as I see you divine, entirely from my own personal experiences in the same direction. Follow these instructions, and you will no longer enter the state of higher space. The entrances will be blocked, effectively. Mr. Mudge sat bolt upright in his chair to listen— and John Silence cleared his throat, and began to read slowly, in a very distinct voice. But before he had uttered a dozen words, something happened. A sound of street music entered the room through the open ventilators, for a band had begun to play in the stable mews at the back of the house, the march from Tannhäuser. Odd as it may seem that a German band should twice within the space of an hour enter the same mews and play Wagner, it was nevertheless the fact. Mr. Racine Mudge heard it. He uttered a sharp, squeaking cry, and twisted his arms with nervous energy round the chair. A piteous look that was not far from tears spread over his white face. Grey shadows followed it. The grey of fear— he began to struggle convulsively. "'Hold me fast! Catch me! For God's sake, keep me here! I'm on the rush already! Oh, it's frightful!' he cried in tones of anguish, his voice as thin as a reed. Dr. Silence made a plunge forward to seize him, but in a flash, before he could cover the space between them, Mr. Racine Mudge, screaming and struggling, seemed to shoot past him into invisibility. He disappeared like an arrow from a bow propelled at infinite speed, and his voice no longer sounded in the external air, but seemed in some curious way to make itself heard somewhere within the depths of the doctor's own being. It was almost like a faint singing cry in his head, like a voice of dream, a voice of vision, and unreality. "'Alcohol! Alcohol!' it cried. Give me alcohol! It's the quickest way! Alcohol, before I'm out of reach!" The doctor, accustomed to rapid decisions and even more rapid action, 
remembered that her brandy flask stood upon the mantelpiece, and in less than a second he had seized it, and was holding it out towards the space above the chair recently occupied by the visible Mudge. Then, before his very eyes, and long ere he could unscrew the metal stopper, he saw the contents of the closed glass file sink and lessen, as though someone were drinking violently and greedily of the liquor within. "'Thanks! Enough! It deadens the vibrations!' cried the faint voice in his interior, as he withdrew the flask and set it back upon the mantelpiece. He understood that in Mudge's present condition one side of the flask was open to space, and he could drink without removing the stopper. He could hardly have had a more interesting proof of what he had been hearing described at such length. But the next moment, the very same moment, it almost seemed, the German band stopped midway in its tune, and there was Mr. Mudge back in his chair again, gasping and panting. "'Quick!' he shrieked. "'Stop that band! Send it away! Catch hold of me! Block the entrances! Block the entrances! Give me the red book! <laughs> the music had begun again. It was merely a temporary interruption. The Tannhäuser march started again, this time at a tremendous pace that made it sound like a rapid two-step, as though the instruments played against time. But the brief interruption gave Dr. Silence a moment in which to collect his scattering thoughts, and before the band had got through half a bar, he had flung forward upon the chair and held Mr. Racine Mudge, the struggling little victim of higher space, in a grip of iron. His arms went all round his diminutive person, taking in a good part of the chair at the same time. He was not a big man, yet he seemed to smother Mudge completely. Yet, even as he did so, and felt the wriggling form underneath him, it began to melt and slip away like air or water. The wood of the armchair somehow disentangled itself from between his own arms and those of Mudge. The phenomenon known as the passage of matter through matter took place. The little man seemed actually to get mixed up in his own being. Dr. Silence could just see his face beneath him. It puckered and grew dark as though from some great internal effort. He heard the thin, reedy voice cry in his ear to block the entrances, block the entrances. And then— But how in the world describe what is indescribable? John Silence half rose up to watch. Racine Mudge, his face distorted beyond all recognition, was making a marvellous inward movement, as though doubling back upon himself. He turned funnel-wise like water in a whirling vortex, and then appeared to break up somewhat as reflection breaks up and divides in a distorting convex mirror. He went neither forward nor backwards, neither to the right nor the left neither up nor down. But he went, he went utterly, he simply flashed away out of sight, like a vanishing projectile. All but one leg. Dr. Silence just had the time and the presence of mind to seize upon the left ankle and boot as it disappeared, and to this he held on for several seconds like grim death. Yet all the time he knew it was a foolish and useless thing to do. The foot was in his grasp one moment, and the next it seemed—this was the only way he could describe it—inside his own skin and bones, and at the same time outside his hand and all round it. It seemed mixed up in some amazing way with his own flesh and blood. Then it was gone, and he was tightly grasping a draught of heated air. "'Gone! Gone! Gone!' cried a thick— whispering voice somewhere deep within his own consciousness. "'Lost! Lost! Lost!' it repeated, growing fainter and fainter, till at length it vanished into nothing, and the last signs of Mr. Racine Mudge vanished with it. John Silence locked his red book and replaced it in the cabinet, which he fastened with a click, and when Barker answered the bell, he inquired if Mr. Mudge had left a card upon the table. It appeared that he had, and when the servant returned with it, Dr. Silence read the address, and made a note of it. It was in North London. Mr. Mudge has gone. 
he said quietly to Barker, noticing his expression of alarm. "'He's not taken his hat with him, sir. Mr. Mudge requires no hat where he is now,' continued the doctor, stooping to poke the fire. "'But he may return for it. And the umbrella, sir? And the umbrella. He didn't go out my way, sir, if you please,' stuttered the amazed servant, his curiosity overcoming his nervousness. Mr. Mudge has his own way of coming and going, and prefers it. If he returns by the door at any time, remember to bring him instantly to me, and be kind and gentle with him, and ask no questions. Also, remember, Barker, to think pleasantly, sympathetically, affectionately of him while he is away. Mr. Mudge is a very suffering gentleman. Barker bowed and went out of the room backwards, gasping and feeling round the inside of his collar with three very hot fingers of one hand. It was two days later when he brought in a telegram to the study. Dr. Silence opened it, and read as follows. "'Bombay. Just slipped out again. All safe. Have blocked entrances. Thousand thanks. Address Cooks, London. Mudge.' Dr. Silence looked up and saw Barker staring at him bewilderingly. It occurred to him that somehow he knew the contents of the telegram. "'Make a parcel of Mr. Mudge's things,' he said briefly, "'and address them Thomas Cook and Sons, Ludgate Circus, and send them there exactly a month from today, and marked to be called for.' "'Yes, sir,' said Barker, leaving the room with a deep sigh and a hurried glance at the waste paper basket where his master had dropped the pink paper. If you enjoyed listening today, be sure to subscribe to the channel by hitting the red subscribe button below. After doing so, click the bell icon next to the subscribe button to receive new content notifications. If you'd like to support our work and receive exclusive perks, consider becoming a channel member by clicking the Join button below. To support us in other ways, see the video description for links to our Bandcamp and Patreon pages, our merch store over at Teespring, and further information relating to our releases on Audible, iTunes, and Spotify. And until next time.